Good evening to one and all present here. On this auspicious day of Saraswati Puja, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to 120th IDG session. Today, the IDG family is honored to have Honorable Justice Sujata Manoharji, retired Supreme Court judge and former member of National Human Rights Commission of India. Ma'am has been working selflessly for the growth of our judicial system and upliftment of our constitutional values. Thank you so much, ma'am, for accepting our invitation and gracing us with your presence. The moderator for today's session is Mr. Tanisha Arora, one of the co-conveners of IDG. Now, I would request him to take the session forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aditi. Uh, good evening, ma'am. I'm glad that finally you can hear us now. And we are, we are also, I mean, you are also audible to us. So welcome everybody to the 120th informal discussion group session. Justice Sujata Manohar, retired judge of the Supreme Court and former member of the National Human Rights Commission. Uh, Ma'am, on behalf of the IDG and our university, I would like to invite Shri Solanki to give a brief introduction of you for all the attendees. Thank you, Tanish. A uh, very good evening to all. I, Srishti Solanki, treasurer of the IDG, take the privilege of welcoming you all to the 120th IDG session. As that has been already mentioned, we have Justice Sujata Manohar Ma'am with us today, a former judge of the Supreme Court and a former member of NHRC. Ma'am is an honorary fellow of the Lady Margaret Hall Oxford and an honorary bencher of the Lincolns in London. A patron of the Oxford University Commonwealth Law Journal, she is the first woman Indian judge and jurist to be awarded the Ruth Bader Ginsburg Medal of Honor. Ma'am, was appointed a judge of the High Court of Bombay in 1978, the first woman judge of that court. In January 1994, she was appointed Chief Justice of the High Court of Bombay, the first woman to hold that post. In April 1994, she was transferred as the, as the Chief Justice of Kerala High Court, again the first woman to hold that post. At the end of 1994, after 16 years as a High Court judge, she was appointed as a judge of the Supreme Court of India, from which she retired in 1999. We are truly honored to have Ma'am with us today. Through the session, she shall be enlightening us on the topic of independence of judiciary. Now, I would request Tanish to take the session forward. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So, quick introduction. Uh, Ma'am, would you uh, want to start the session now? Okay, that's fine. Uh, well, I'm going to first of all talk to you about the independence of the judiciary and then maybe I was told some of you might want to ask some questions about women in the judiciary. So yes, maybe sir. a little bit about that. Hmm? So I think that I thought we should discuss independence of the judiciary first because it is a matter of vital importance to all of us. Now, any dem democracy which has a constitution that provides for division of power between different organs of governance or provides a system of checks and balances to ensure good governance along with protection of rights of uh, individuals uh, and human rights must have a mechanism by which it can be ensured that the the constitutional system is properly enforced and the only organ which is normally given this task is the judiciary. So we don't have a judiciary which just adjudicates between two persons, between different, uh, between disputes. You have a judiciary which has a major constitutional function of making sure that the constitutional provisions for distribution of power are properly implemented. So, it has to be a judiciary which is independent. By independent, I mean not affected by any kind of a pressure from any organization, body, individual, anything. It should be possible for the judges to stand out, to stand up against all these pressures and decide a case before it 
in accordance with the constitution and the laws. You know, the judges have to take an oath which says, I will decide without fear or favor, affection or ill will in accordance with the constitution and the laws, which means you have to be really independent and be able to stand up to pressures. The second thing, which is absolutely essential, of course, and is normally not stated because it is taken for granted, is that there must be complete integrity within the judiciary. And uh, the judges should not be moved by other temptations to decide one way or the other. Now, the question is, how do we secure an independent judiciary and do we have adequate mechanisms available to ensure that we select judges who are independent because to say afterwards that well we made a mistake and we selected an unsuitable person now we have to remove him or her I think it's not a very desirable situation it undermines public confidence in the judiciary so we have to be very careful whom we appoint. In fact, as you know, the easiest way to destroy an institution is to appoint wrong people to it. So now, now what do we do? Now I will, let us look at our existing system. Uh, we have had, as you know, four judges cases dealing with this problem of appointment and uh, ultimate outcome is perhaps still not totally satisfactory because it is not good to in my view at least to involve sitting judges in the process of selecting judges they have enough workload as it is they don't have enough time to examine the judges, the judgments of other judges, unless those judgments come before them for adjudication. And they may not be aware of the background and they may not be always be available, uh, uh, aware of the reputation, etc., of a judge. Of course, there is an administrative setup which is supposed to give them material. But I don't know how effective or rather how uh, well whether it re can really deal with the number of high courts that we have I'm talking about the appointments to the Supreme Court just now and the uh, kind of uh, uh, information they get because you can also get slanted information it is not always correct in fact as soon as a person's name is proposed as a judge either of the high court or of the supreme court you will get a hundred complaints before that there may have been nothing so, so you have to be very careful about the kind of complaints you get you have to be very careful that you are not unfair to an honest person and that you select the right person this is a very heavy burden and uh, we have uh, what we have tried to do in the judges' cases is not to give the government a final say. Now, you see, uh, the state is no longer just uh, an outsider which is looking at the judiciary. The state is one of our major litigants now. For example, the state has... Uh, major economic activities and a lot of cases involve state as a litigant. Then we have a whole lot of constitutional cases involving fundamental rights where the state is a party. There may be cases which involve environment where the state has to be a party. So all the large number of cases, in fact state is one of the major litigants today before the courts. Now, can you really entrust a major litigant with a final say in the appointment of judges? It can have a say, but can it have a final say? So that was the first problem that we had to deal with. Now, the judges' cases basically 
tried to formalize, in my view, what was the actual practice in the sense that uh, with the chief justice of a high court, if it was a high court judge, would not only consult senior judges, he would consult senior lawyers who appeared in court and find out about the reputation of a lawyer who was <clears throat> proposed to be a judge and so on. Then he would consult the government leader, the, high, the state, and then make a recommendation. Now this has this was not always done. Same thing when the Supreme Court judge was to be appointed, the Chief Justice of India would consult his colleagues and those, especially those who came from the same high court from which the judge was coming so that they would know a little more about him. And this sort of thing always informally went on. But it was not officially done. So I think the... the courts were worried that this kind of a consultation which really gave proper information uh, was not always being done. So we have had the judges cases saying formalizing that you should have a collegium and then what is to be done. You know exactly what the procedure now is. And then the last time um, the, you know, and then you as you know people were not quite happy with the collegium, whether it is transparent or not, and so on. So the government had proposed a National Judicial Commission uh, in 1915, I think, in 2015. And this was also struck down by the court saying because of the composition of the National Judicial Commission, because it did not give a final say to the judges. And it was held that this was contrary to the constitutional scheme and it would violate independence of the judges. So this is where we stand now. Now we, we have a system which is not entirely satisfactory and many have suggested that we should have a National Judicial Commission but with a better composition which will give a more say to the judges and we, maybe we could involve academicians and we could involve even lay public. And there are other countries which have tried this out. England, for example, has a Judicial Appointment Commission, uh, which has been working, I think, since 2005 or seven. I'm not quite sure. You might know better. And there the lay person is the chair of the commission. And they have lawyers and judges and the Lord Chancellor consults, uh, is uh, given recommendations by this commission and then he appoints. And they seem to be fairly happy with the way it is working. So ultimately it is, it really boils down to the traditions of a country, how you respect your institutions and whether you have right people again in the appointing commission. <laughs> so you come back to the same problem. Who are the right people? How? So this is one area which we have to discuss. How do we get the right people? And the next problem is about supposing you have a wrong person, how do you remove him? Because there is a complete, the problem is that you must give judges complete protection against a removal on account of the judgments which they give. And we do have that complete protection. So the only way you can remove higher judiciary is by impeachment, which again is a political process. It's not a legal process. It's a political process. And you know political outcomes, what happens when there is impeachment. You are very well aware of what happened in the past. So how do you remove a person who is really not suitable because he can do a lot of damage? And uh, I, I will tell you about uh, the experiment which Kenya tried. Kenya had a judiciary which had, uh, with which they had a lot of problems, a lot of corruption, uh, uh, influence, uh, <clears throat> selling and things like that. So when the new constitution was uh, set up, I think in 2010, was it? something like that. The constitution provided that there will be a judge's vetting board 
which will look at all sitting judges and magistrates and remove those which were unsuitable. And that, in that vetting board, apart from their um, existing lawyers and sitting judges, they had three chief justices from the Commonwealth on it, independent. And they would constitute panels and give an opportunity to the judge to have his say. And if the vetting uh, board decided that the judge was um, not suitable, he had to go. He, there was no right of appeal. He could only ask for a review before another panel if he found some new material of the, if there was error apparent on the face of the record, not otherwise. And the, high, and the judiciary could not intervene to reinstate him. So this was accepted by the country because they found that there was urgent need to quickly set right their judiciary. And it seems to have worked very well. And I think that is a great tribute to their vetting board that the way they decided was accepted by everybody. There were a few challenges, but ultimately they succeeded in their task. And in the year and a half, they had screened everybody and unsuitable people had been removed. But that system we cannot have. After, <laughs> because constitutionally we have a right of judicial review and uh, you can't just say that well first of all our constitution has no provision for anything like what the Kenya had and if it had it I'm sure it would be challenged saying that this is contrary to the entire uh, first principles of uh, independence of the judiciary and so on so this is another problem that we have how do we remove an unsuitable person without undermining judicial independence. So these are the two main issues. And this will also have apply to other sort of minor problems, so not minor problems, but other uh, allied problems like transfer of judges and things like that. So this is, that is why I said that this is an area where you must apply your mind and decide how the country can have a system which ensures that we have good judges, they are independent, and they live up to public expectations. So that is your first uh, area of concern. And secondly, the second area of concern is about women judges. I will only tell you very briefly because I don't know how much time we will have. Uh, the, you see, up to now, for a long time, Women were associated with law only as objects of lawmaking. There's so many laws which give, don't give women rights, which sort of hamper them in their work and so on and so forth. So how do you improve your laws? How do you amend the laws? <clears throat> we had the Widow Remarriage Act, Sati uh, Abolition Act. All the, quite a few of them originated in West Bengal. And... Uh, then we had the Hindu Women's Right to Property Act, 1937 and so on. They were all meant to give better rights to women. But for the first time, after women started applying to become lawyers, that women got associated with law as people who could practice law, as people who could contribute to improvement of the legal system, and not just people who advised women on what were their legal rights. So I think the first woman, I'll just give you, uh, I don't know how much time we have. Uh, the first woman actually who applied to be enrolled as a legal practitioner was from Calcutta, Regina Guha, in, I think, uh, 1914, she was she was a brilliant student. She stood first in the university in her MA examination. And after doing her law, she applied for enrollment as a uh, pleader in the district court at Alipur. 
and it was such an unusual application. A full bench of the Calcutta High Court was, was constituted to hear her application. And Chief Justice Mukherjee looked at the history of women in the legal profession. He said, well, there have been women who have argued their own case before a court. There have been women, Qazis, who have acted as judges. But he could not find a single case of a woman who had argued a case for another person. So he said, our Legal Practitioners Act does not contemplate women at all. Then he said, I've talked about other facilities for women practicing. He said, we don't have toilets, for example, and things like that. And so our law does not contemplate women. So he turned out the application, although the Advocate General said that he would be very happy if the court would find its way to giving her the privilege. So she was denied. But the most interesting part was that Cordelia Surabji, I, I can't go into the whole history, but she ultimately, in 1921, uh, persuaded the Allahabad High Court to give her the privilege of practicing. But she was told that she could not appear in court. She could only advise Pardadashin ladies. And then after that, the Legal Practitioners Act was amended in 1923. And women were expressly allowed to enroll. And that is how we got our first woman who got enrolled as a barrister in the Bombay High Court, Meetha Lam. And uh, she could not get any work at all. She tried and then she gave up. Uh, she got one brief. And she was very curious how she got that brief. So she asked the solicitor, "What is? how have you briefed me? He said, well, my client is so confident that he can never lose his case. But he wanted his opponent to be humiliated by being defeated at the hands of a woman. So, <laughs> so after that, she gave up practice. But she became the sheriff of Bombay and she did a lot of work for legal reform. So this is the background in which you have to see how we are going to have, uh, what do we require uh, to support women in the judiciary, women in the legal profession. So we can have a discussion on that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for that address, ma'am. So I, I can see multiple questions in the panel. If you want, you can start from that one. Ma'am, sh shall I start with the questions? Or there yes, are start with the questions. So, yes, ma'am. And so the first question is being asked by Priyansh Tiwari, who is a second year student at NUJS. He asks that uh, he wants to know your views on the National Judicial Appointments Commission and could it have been a viable alternative to the collegium system? Could it sound a little more loudly? Second part I didn't hear. Ma'am, the second part is he asks that whether the National Judicial Appointments Commission could be a better alternative to the collegium system. Uh, it's my personal view. I think yes, provided it is properly constituted. It depends entirely on how you constitute it. Because if you constitute it with all the <clears throat> government nominees and politicians, then I would say no. But uh, if it's properly constituted, giving a proper balance between the judges, the, uh, all the, the law ministry, academicians, lay people. Yes, I think it would be a better alternative. Thank you. Thank you for the answer, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, ma'am, the ne next question is being asked by Nadia Murshid. Uh, mm -hmm. She says that, do you think the judiciary should take steps to have more diversity within itself? Uh, you see, in my view, at the highest levels of judiciary, what you have to look for is competence. That is the first and foremost factor that you can't have an incompetent judge, irrespective of his background, diversity, his or her background, diversity, whatever. Now, given that you have a good person who is suitable for judgeship, then you'll also look for diversity if possible, so that you have a different uh, I think that is particularly probably important for criminal matters, 
where appreciation of facts, uh, the diversity of background and experiences helps in better understanding facts and appreciating the kind of crime which has been committed and so on. So diversity is relevant, but it cannot be at the sacrifice of competence. So in my view, at the, this level, first and foremost, you must look for competence. And then if you also have a diversity, very good. And please support that diversity. And if something, everything being equal, or even the little ups and downs are okay, but it cannot be totally at the cost of competence. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for the answer, ma'am. So the next question is being asked by Abhin Nadrit. He asks that what dimensions do you think a female judge can bring in the judicial verdicts? Uh, well, first of all, I assume that it is a competent woman. I, I don't believe in having a woman for the sake of having a woman. I don't believe in tokenism at all. You must have women who are competent, who are capable of delivering justice. Now, what, as I said with diversity, what happens is that there are in the in our society various inbuilt prejudices against women or certain preconceived notions of what women should or should not be doing and so on and that of they often come in while decide while adjudicating what a woman has done so if you have women judges i think it will help remove some of these patriarchal uh, notions which sometimes creep into judgments. Not always. We have had some very fine judgments, uh, pro-women judgments by men judges. I mean, let us not forget that. But any sort of uh, predilection towards uh, some preconceived notions about how women behave or what they should be doing and so on will be reduced. I have, uh, let us hope eliminated if there are more women judges on the bench. Yes. Also, it will also give more confidence to women lawyers who are practicing before the court. Quite often, women get intimidated by the fact that there are so many men who are there and there are very few women. And sometimes judges also take a little harsher view of women <laughs> who may make some mistakes in court and so on. So I think a presence of a woman judge will have a supportive uh, effect on women who are practicing. And we want all men and women who are good to come forth and contribute to our legal system. And I think this it will help if we have more women judges. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. So mm -hmm. the next question is from Navya Salampuria. Uh, ma'am. In addition to her question, I was I would I would also like to add some part which I personally want to ask you. Huh. Um, Navya asks that how far do you think is it a good proposition to have retired judges as members of the parliament? So this is her question, ma'am. I also want to ask you one thing: uh, hmm. whether you think that the nomination of retired judges, like we had the nomination of the uh, ex CJI Mr. Ranjan Gogoi whether that is constitutional in your opinion, nomination to the Rajya Sabha? Frankly, I don't think it is a good idea for retired judges to join parliament. I don't think there is any need to do that. Uh, if uh, we have law commission, which recommends reforms to laws, and they, they can better be associated with law commission rather than with parliament. Parliament is not the place for judges, in my view. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, yes. Uh, yes, ma'am. So, ma'am, the next question is from Srishti Solanki, who, mm -hmm. who also introduced you in the starting of the session. Right. Uh, so, ma'am, she asks that uh, slightly discussing from the issue at hand, what mm -hmm. is your view on regional benches of the Supreme Court in order to improve justice delivery as well as reducing the burden of backlogs on the Apex Court. Uh, having what what benches is it? Sorry, I didn't get. Ma'am, ma'am, basically she wants to ask hmm. that what is your view on regional benches of the Supreme Court? Oh. In order to... Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, 
first of all, Supreme Court must be a one united body to have any effect on the final decision making in the country. But if you have this body which occasionally travels to different parts of the country, depends on, you see, we have already 34 judges. I think that is very large for a Supreme Court. I don't think, because it, to act as a coherent body with same policy, you don't require such a large number of judges. I think that itself is a bit of a problem. Now, America has, a, for example, only nine judges. It's a huge country. Of course, the population is much less, but still. So, but if you can possibly have a bench of six, three or four judges who can go to different areas at different times, it is, it, it is feasible. I think if it is feasible, yes. But don't forget that as soon as you have regional hearings, you will have a regional bar, your standards will be also get affected. I'm not very happy about it. We can try it as an experiment to see how it works, but I don't know. I'm, I'm, I think thinking around it on the whole, I think it's not a very good idea. I think we should try and see uh, how we can reduce our areas. I think it's a major problem. And uh, without having to do all these things. First of all, I think we can do something about special leave petitions and there's no need for the Supreme Court to entertain all these special leave petitions. They were not supposed meant for doing this. And some kind of a policy making is required. I think because there's so much work, they don't have time to sit back and think about policy making. So I think maybe perhaps something needs to be done there to reduce the burden of work. For example, as you know, the American Supreme Court only takes a limited number of cases. I think we have to keep calm, keep more, have more confidence in our high courts and have uh, rather than sort of try and change everything. <laughs> For example, in Bombay, there was this case of, you know, this Dahi Handi at the time of uh, Gokulashtami. And the High Court said that you should not have beyond a certain point because people fall down without any safety measures and they break their limbs and so on. Now, why should Supreme Court interfere in a thing like that? You know, I think <laughs> so, so we need to restrain ourselves also. I mean, everybody wants justice and you judges want to do justice. But I think there's a point beyond which... I mean, you can't really travel. But anyway, um, that is my view. Thank you. Thank you so much for your answer, ma'am. Ma'am, mm -hmm. along those lines, I, I had a question myself as well. So as you mm -hmm. said that we should have some trust in the high courts. So ma'am, recently what we have been observing is that the Supreme Court is clogged with bail matters. There are many bail applications in the Supreme Court. Ma'am, do you have any opinion on this as to how to uh, keep the bail applications from clogging the Supreme Court with uh, so much intensity? Because, yes, ma'am. <laughs> I, I agree with you. And I think it's, it's sad that this is happening. It's really sad. And it's probably, I think, this is really a, it's part of the failure of the criminal justice system in the country now. Yes, ma'am. And uh, maybe lack of proper investigation also is a part of it. But why is this... Uh, I don't know, because we have been, the courts have been saying for a long time that bail and not jail. And uh, actually, the some, the some of the laws provide the opposite. So, <laughs> so I agree yes. with you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, so we have with us Karishma Kumari, who is a first-year student at NUJS. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, she would like to ask a question to you herself. Okay. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. Am I audible? I, I can't hear you at all. Karishma, can you speak a little louder? I think she'll be able louder, to... Louder, huh? 
Good evening, ma'am. Hmm. Ma'am, now that more women are choosing law as an active career, do you do you see a change in how women in law were treated when you started and now? <laughs> I'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> the first day I went to the Bombay bar, you know, the an old friend of the family came to me and said. Why have you come here to practice? Are you looking for a husband? So <laughs> I said, <laughs> I, I don't want to look for a husband here. Then another solicitor came to me, and he gave me a book of poems which he had written. He was known for writing poems, and the very first poem was about a woman lawyer. And it said, I think, a lovely young woman, advocate, went to the small causes gate to act, appear, plead, and state her client's case in a way delicate, or something like that. <laughs> so <laughs> I thanked him for that, <laughs> but he didn't approve of women thumping the desk. You have to argue your case in a very delicate manner. So all kinds of reactions. I think women were just in those days. It was thought that they will come for a little while, get married, and go away. So nobody took them seriously. It was only after <laughs> I was there and then I got married, and then this thought I will go away, but I didn't go away. And then I had children, and then they thought I will go away, but I did not go away. After that, I started getting work. So <laughs> that is how it is. Uh, things now are much better, as far as I can see. Uh, the young women who are now practicing, I think, not only they are working in law firms very nicely, but they are also appearing in court quite often. I am doing arbitrations and. Large number of women lawyers, young women lawyers, are appearing in arbitrations before me. I'm very happy to see that, and they're doing very well. And they're helping also very nicely. So I think there is a vast change in the attitude to women lawyers, and I think you should all take advantage of it. And it also depends on numbers. If there are more women practicing, the more support you will get. And you, it will be taken for granted that women can also practice. Thank you, thank you so much for that, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, we also have Neil, who is another member of the IDG itself, and he would also like a like to ask a question to you. Hi. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, uh, ma'am. Having been one of the most renowned judges in India, uh, how would you differ the statements uh, being just and being according to law uh, as a judge yourself? Uh, and where does both intersect if they do at all? Sorry, I, I sorry I couldn't follow. I'll repeat the question. Um, how would you defer the statements being just and being according to law as a yeah. judge? And uh, where does these both statements intersect and if they do at all? Well, why should you mean? Is there a conflict between law and justice? Is that what you want to suggest? No, ma'am. How does uh, a judge or the court uh, differs between the two? There is no need to. Well, first of all, a judge has to uh, apply the law. Secondly, how you interpret the law and how you apply it depends on what you consider as justice. I mean, there is there is no dichotomy between the two. If the law is unjust, then you have to say so and ask that law be changed, as it often happens. Sometimes the judges do say that this uh, uh, the provision needs to be changed. There should be lauded. Um, there should be an amendment of the law because this this often happens in the case of personal laws, uh, because quite often uh, we held long time ago that personal laws cannot be changed by the courts, but it has to be done by law reform. So you need to have law which is amended or changed. 
so that, that is why if where there is an obvious conflict between justice and law, you say that this law needs to be changed. Or sometimes you apply international human rights standards, as we did in the Vishakha case, to fill the gap in the law. That can happen. Or it was also done in the case of adoption of foreign children, where the court laid down guidelines to make sure that the children were not ill-treated or wrongly placed. So it depends upon the situation and how you deal with it. You try and reconcile law and justice as much as possible. Where it is not possible, you ask for change. Thank you. Thank you for the answer, ma'am. Uh, so, ma'am, we also have with us a uh, final year student of our college, uh, Agniva Chakrabarti, and he would like to ask a question to you. Okay. Uh, your ladyship, I just wanted to ask you, do you think there should be serious reforms be considered in the registry in terms of what matters get precedence? Because we have seen in the recent time that some matters which are of political significance get listed prior to other matters which are uh, pending before the court for a number of years. No, no, I agree with you. There are so many things which can be straightened out within the court administration itself. Probably we need trained administrators who can deal with cases properly, classify them. In the old days, we used to classify cases so that 10 or 15 cases involving the same point got decided at the same time. But now I don't know if it is... Probably it is still being done, I am not sure. But I think there must be proper uh, way of classifying cases, listing them priority-wise. I think it has to be done with the guidance of the chief justice and some senior administrative judges that which cases should get priority and so on. You must have a system by which people know that these kinds of cases will get priority. It should not be ad hoc. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you for the answer, ma'am. Uh, so, ma'am, uh, a question is being asked by Krishna Tiwari. He basically wants to know your opinion on having a cooling off period for the post-judicial appointments of judges. A cooling off period post uh, Yes, after? Oh, yes. Yes, I agree with you. In fact, uh, it depends on the kind of appointment. But... Uh, you see, that there is another problem with, I should have mentioned it while, while talking about uh, independence of the judiciary, that you should not have a situation where the judges have to look for post-retirement appointments. You should give them, give them full pay as retirement benefit so that they don't have to look for all these appointments. At the same time, if you need some retired judges, for some tribunals which you have set up or some committees or whatever. Uh, then uh, you have to, well, it should not be the monetary reward that should be the consideration. So that the judges don't accept because they are getting a fancy pay. They should, if they get their full pension, that is enough. After that, if they, if they are appointed to a committee, they don't have to be paid anything. They are getting their pension anyway. And then you can appoint them. There is no problem there. So, basically, I think you have to make proper arrangements for retirement benefits for judges. Thank you. Thank you for that, ma'am. So, ma'am, the next question is being asked by Aditi itself. Ma'am, she wants to know, how do you view the in-house procedure norms for inquiring charges against judges of the higher judiciary? And there's a follow-up to this question. How justified is it to shroud the entire process in mystery and opacity under the garb of maintaining the independence of judiciary? I'm sorry, the first part I didn't get. Yes, ma'am. Uh, first part is basically how, how do you view the in-house procedure norms for inquiring charges against judges of the higher judiciary? Uh, well, there are... Uh, if the answer is yes, uh, both yes and no, in the sense that uh, inquiry procedure uh, 
You see, there are all kinds of allegations which seem to be made against judges. Perhaps you don't realize. Um, there are some people who will make charges against any and every judge, irrespective of her. <laughs> then there are other, and there are those where there are serious charges. Hopefully, I, I hope that these uh, trivial things and useless charges are not deserving of any kind of invite. Uh, they should be just dismissed, just like that. And for that, you don't require any kind of a procedure. But for charges which require to be gone into, uh, I think that it requires some kind of a transparency in the way in which you investigate those charges. So completely in-house procedure, I don't really know whether it's a good thing. Uh, I think there should be. Well, the judges who, who are inquiring should decide whether it is in public interest to allow uh, access to its proceedings or not. It will depend very much on how they are investigating and what they are investigating. I can't say it in the abstract. But I'm sure there are cases where it would be better to have transparency, but not always. So I'm sorry, I can't give a clear answer to that. Got it, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And so the next question is from Nitin, Ka Nitin Carlson. Uh, since, ma'am, you have been part of the NHRC, he wants to know whether the NHRC is free from political intrusion. Just now, or well, the Paris principles, which are supposed to govern uh, human rights commissions, require that it should be totally free from government intervention, and they should make sure that they are not seen as being associated with government. And that is what we did. In fact, we decided to go to Farid Court House rather than go to one of the premises which were offered by the government because. We felt that it should be a separate premise and we should not be associated with government. Uh, but I think the present practice, I don't know. Okay, okay. Th thank you so much, ma'am. So, oh, ma the next question is from Anurudh Goel, another oh. final year student of our college. Ma'am, he wants to ask you that uh, whether we should strive towards making the Supreme Court a strictly constitutional court and make separate regional appellate courts to hear matters of appeal from the High Court. I'm against having too many courts. As it is, there are so many appeals and matters that don't seem to get finished at all. I think let us have fewer courts which are more effective. But uh, I think so if you do the, all this sort of thing, you will have all SLPs going to all this a court of appeal, you will have a whole lot of cases there which need not be there at all. As I said, if you trust your high courts, you don't need anything more than that. And at some point, you must stop and make sure that then you have really good judges in the high court. I think that is important. I, I don't like the idea of this is a very easy way of saying now the Supreme Court is rid of areas because of the stance for everything to another court. I don't know if that's a good way of doing things. Okay, okay. But it's a difficult Thanks. problem. I think we are in a very difficult situation. Got it, ma'am. Thank, thank you so much, ma'am. So, ma'am, the next question is from Abhin. He wants to ask whether the judicial appoint judicial independence is a measure of the country's growth as a democracy, but sometimes, though not directly affecting the judgment, media trials like the Me Too movement do tend to overshadow it in a way. What are your thoughts on this? Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm afraid I agree with that. We are having too many media trials. Uh, so, but I, it's not also advisable to 
prevent media from commenting, let them comment. But the answer is that instead of having uh, these kinds of discussions and delays in deciding, let us decide matters quickly so that we don't have too much media exposure to all these various problems. Thank you so much, ma'am. I think uh, Tanish has some network issue. Moving on to the next question, Nave Salampuri is asking, do you believe that elections to judicial post as seen in the USA is possible in India? Even if it is possible, you should never go for elections because it's already, it's very bad if judges have to be elected. I remember a case in California where a judge was due for re-election. And he gave an excellent judgment, which the people did not like. And he told publicly that I know that after this judgment, I will not be reappointed, re-elected as a judge. But I feel it my duty to give the correct judgment. And he was right. He was not re-elected. I don't think we should go in for elected judges at all. Thank you so much for the answer, ma'am. Krishna Tiwari is asking, recently, the law minister in reply to the Madras High Court comments, criticizing the Election Commission for holding Bengal elections in second COVID wave, said that the judiciary should restrain from making such comments. What are your views on that? Should such comments or intervention be made by the law minister? No, no I don't want to comment on the thing like this. This is a matter between the law minister and the High Court. I won't comment on this. Uh, moving to the next question, ma'am. Kavan Patel is asking, um, how do you think about opening the tribunals for young candidates instead of the current age restriction, which only allows retired judges to be judicial members in tribunals? What are your views on that? You mean who would you have instead in the tribunals? Yes, sir. Sorry. Instead of retired judges, he is asking uh -huh. whether it is a wise decision to have young candidates um, in the tribunals. Yes, I don't see any problem. If you want young candidates, you should have them. Yes. You don't have to have retired judges. I don't know what the problem is. Maybe there are new tribunals and they don't have a proper bar. So from which to choose. I think that might be a problem. But if they have been there for some time, you will have a bar from which you can choose. I don't see any problem. You can choose young people. Thank you so much, ma'am. Next question is from Neil Tulsiani. Having been a fellow of Lady Margaret Hall, Oxford, and a bencher Lincoln's in London, how do you feel the judicial system of the two countries differ, that is the UK and India, in terms of independence of judiciary? Well, it's very difficult to compare because uh, culture, traditions, everything is different. But I think they have not done badly. And uh, they had a problem earlier, which they have solved by having a Judicial Appointments Commission. And they still have, I think, well, they have some, they have other problems. England, Scotland, and, you know, they don't have a written constitution. And how do they <clears throat> deal with uh, European Court of Human Rights? You know, there are uh, Problems are different, so it's not very difficult to compare. But I think we have not done too badly. <laughs> Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, moving towards the end of the session, um, I had this question that uh, what advice or what suggestion would you like to give to the um, aspirants who are looking forward to join judiciary? Join judiciary, okay. Oh, I don't really know if I, um, all you, what I can say is that uh, you must, uh, well, you must have a very sound grounding in law to start with, to, so that you can apply it to the cases which come before you. And uh, you should, uh, what else can I say? Uh, Listen to the arguments which are, uh, as a judge, which are made before you, but ultimately you have to decide according to your own light. 
you know, there was a, <laughs> there's a very nice advice which Desmond, uh, uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu gave to lawyers. He told them, don't raise your voice, raise the quality of your argument. So I think the judges also should make sure that they're not carried away by the raising of voice at the bar. They must <laughs> decide it depending on the quality of the argument. I think that is the advice I would give to the judge. Quite often judges get overawed by the shouting which goes on in court. Don't get impressed by that. <laughs> Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, that was the advice. I think most of us was looking forward. We're looking forward to it. Um, over to you, Tanish, uh, since he's back. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, ma'am. I had a question to ask you. Uh, I I think you, I think you mentioned that you are against having so many quotes while answering one of the questions. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, so I had a very small question in light of that. Basically, I wanted to know your opinion. On tribunalization, basically, are you in favor of having multiple tribunals for dealing with different matters? And secondly, whether the appointment in the tribunals, since it is made by the government, do you think it harms the independence of the judiciary? No, no, I agree with you. It does. First of all, you have a tribunal, which is, first of all, there are appointments to the tribunal don't have the kind of safeguards which the high courts have, or the courts have. <clears throat> the, the appointees are appointed by the government, so there is no question of independence of the appointees. I mean, all the safeguards have, that we are looking for in appointments to the regular court system are not there. So tribunals are a way of bypassing all the safeguards that your system wants. So I'm, I'm not at all in favor of tribunals. I think tribunals dilute the quality of justice. And we should try and avoid having tribunals as far as possible. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, mm -hmm. I, I also observed that uh, in the National Green Tribunal, I think mm -hmm. we only have two uh, steps. Basically, first, that if a matter has been decided by the NGT, then it is only appellable in the Supreme Court. It, it, cuts out one entire step of appeal itself. So yes, ma'am, I think I agree with what you've said. Uh, ma'am, so I just had one follow-up question to this. So ma'am, since uh, tribunalization is not a very good concept in itself, so ma'am, do you think that in the appointment of judges to the higher courts or the Supreme Court for that matter, should we have some sort of expertise also, like if there is a matter that totally pertains to company law or some other aspect, which may be dealt by a tribunal, and since we would not have a tribunal, do you think judges would also be appointed in such a manner, maybe some part of it? I entirely agree, and it used to be done. For example, there are judges who may be experts in company law, judges who may have done taxation matters, the judges... I mean, there are, there are specializations within the legal system and you should have judges within the court system who are at least one or two judges who deal at least who are experts in these areas. And quite often in the high court, at least I know that we used to look for if there was no labor law judge, then we would see if you could find a suitable candidate from that area or not. If you don't find, then that's a different matter. But... It, uh, there was always an attempt to see that expertise in different areas of law was represented in the courts. And I think it should be done. And when you have 34 judges, then surely you can have representation to all specializations. Yes, I agree with you. Thank you so much, ma'am. So, um, this has been a very enlightening session, I think, for everybody. And especially for me, because I had a lot of questions along these lines to ask you. And I could... With the way of this session, I could ask them to you. Uh, so, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Ma so, if I have your permission, I would just like to invite Ujwala Singh, a member of the IDG, to deliver a vote of thanks for this session. Ujwala. Yes. Um, and now, as a member of the IDG, I, Ujwala Singh, take this opportunity to thank you, Ms. Sujata Manohar, ma'am, for joining us in these extremely testing times during the pandemic. The interaction with you today has been both wonderful and insightful at the same time. And I'm sure with the expression of your valuable stance, the viewers have grasped the nuances of our judiciary in a more holistic way. 
The session has been truly enlightening, ma'am, and we're extremely honored that you graced us with your presence. On the behalf of IDG, we hope that you and your family stay safe and in good health during these tough times. I would also like to thank our committee members and all participants who joined us and raised such intriguing questions to add to the success of this session. Thank you, one and all. Thank you very much. It has been a pleasure talking to all of you. Thank you.